welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway, author of a fair few history books like those behind me. Now today I'm taking you back to the reign of King Henry VIII, a very eventful reign. But on this day in Tudor history, Tuesday the 6th of July 1535, Henry VIII's former friend and Lord Chancellor, Sir Thomas More, was beheaded on Tower Hill as a traitor. As I've mentioned before, More had once said of Henry VIII, if my head would win him a castle in France, it should not fail to go. And go it did. As you know, if you've been watching my previous videos, Moore had been found guilty of high treason under the Treason Act of 1534 for denying the king's supremacy and refusing to take the oath of succession. The punishment for high treason was, of course, death, and Moore was lucky that his sentence was commuted from being hanged, drawn and quartered to beheading. Chronicler Charles Risley recorded his death as follows. This year also, the first day uh, uh, sorry. This year also, the first day of July, being Thursday, Sir Thomas More, Knight, sometime Chancellor of England, was arraigned at Westminster for high treason and there condemned. And the Tuesday after, being the 6th of July, he was beheaded at the Tower Hill, and his body was buried within the chapel in the Tower of London, and his head was set on London Bridge. The effect of his death was for the same cause that the Bishop of Rochester died for. Chronicler Edward Hall wrote, Also the sixth day of July was Sir Thomas More beheaded for the like treason before rehearsed, which, as you've heard, was for the denying of the King's Majesty's supremacy. This man was also counted learned, and, as you've heard before, he was Lord Chancellor of England and in that time a great persecutor of such as detested the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, which he himself so highly favoured that he stood to it till he was brought to the scaffold on the Tower Hill, where, on a block, his head was stricken from his shoulders and had no more harm. I cannot tell whether I should call him a foolish wise man or a wise foolish man, for undoubtedly he, beside his learning, had a great wit but it was so mingled with taunting and mocking that it seemed to them that best knew him that he thought nothing to be well spoken except he administered some mock in the communication insomuch as at his coming to the tower one of the officers demanded his upper garment for his fee meaning his gown and he answered he should have it and took him his cap saying it was the uppermost garment that he had Likewise, even going to his death at the tower gate, a poor woman called unto him and besought him to declare that he had certain evidences of hers in the time that he was in office, which, after he was apprehended, she could not come by, and that he would entreat she might have them again, or else she was undone. He answered, Good woman, have patience a little while, for the king is so good unto me that even within this half hour he will discharge me of all businesses and help thee himself. Also, when he went up the stair on the scaffold, he desired one of the sheriff's officers to give him his hand to help him up, and said, When I come down again, let me shift for myself as well as I can. Also, the hangman kneeled down to him, asking him his forgiveness of his death as the manner is, to whom he said, I forgive thee, but I promise thee that thou shalt never have honesty of the striking of my head, my neck is so short. Also, even when he should lay down his head on the block, he, having a great grey beard, striked out his beard and said to the hangman, I pray you, let me lay my beard over the block, lest ye should cut it. Thus with a mock, he ended his life. A document in Letters and Papers gives the following information about Moore after his trial and about his execution. On his way to the tower, one of his daughters named Margaret pushed through the archers and guards and held him in her embrace some time without being able to speak. Afterwards, Moore, asking leave of the archers, bade her have patience, for it was God's will, and she had long known the secret of his heart. After going ten or twelve steps, she returned and embraced him again, to which he said nothing except to bid her pray to God for his soul, and this without tears or change of colour. On the Tuesday following, he was beheaded in the open space in front of the tower, 
A little before his death, he asked those present to pray to God for him, and he would do the same for them in the other world. He then besought them earnestly to pray to God to give the king good counsel, protesting that he died his faithful servant, but God's first. Such was the miserable end of Moore, who was formerly in great reputation and much loved by the king, his master, and regarded by all as a good man, even to his death. As Charles Risley stated, his body was buried at the chapel of St Peter Advincula at the Tower of London, and his head put on a spike on London Bridge. Heads would eventually be thrown into the River Thames, but Moore's wasn't. E. Reynolds, in the book Margaret Roper, eldest daughter of St. Thomas More, quotes Thomas Stapleton, an early biographer of Thomas More. The head, by order of the king, was placed upon a stake on London Bridge, where it remained for nearly a month until it had to be taken down to make room for other heads. The head would have been thrown into the river had not Margaret Roper, who'd been watching carefully and waiting for the opportunity, bribed the executioner whose office it was to remove the heads and obtained possession of the sacred relic. There was no possibility of mistake for she, with the help of others, had kept careful watch and moreover, there were signs so certain that anyone who'd known him in life would have been able now to identify the head. Reynolds then explains, after the death of Margaret Roper, the head was in the keeping of her eldest daughter, Elizabeth, Lady Bray, and it was probably at her death in 1558 that it was placed in the Roper Vault under the chapel of St Nicholas in St Dunstan's Canterbury. It was seen there in 1835, when by accident the roof of the vault was broken. The head was enclosed in a leaden case with one side open. This stood in a niche protected by an iron grill. The vault was later sealed, but a tablet in the floor above bears the inscription, Beneath this floor is the vault of the Roper family, in which is interred the head of Sir Thomas More of illustrious memory, sometime Lord Chancellor of England, beheaded on Tower Hill the 6th of July, 1535. In an article, The Skull of Sir Thomas More, in the Gentleman's Magazine of May 1837, there is the following quote about More's head being seen in the vault in the 18th century, along with the drawing of the skull. Here is the quote. Dr. then Mr. Rawlinson informed Herm that when the vault was opened in 1715 to enter into one of the Roper's family, the box was seen enclosed in an iron grate. I assume it's still there today. Also on this day in Tudor history, the 6th of July, 1553, 15-year-old King Edward VI died at Greenwich Palace, leaving the throne to his cousin's eldest daughter, Lady Jane Grey. You can find out more about Edward's final illness and his last days, his device for the succession, and Lady Jane Grey's reaction at being told that she was Edward's successor in my video from last year, which I'll give you a link to. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking right there. You can hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live and you can give me a like and leave me a comment. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.